very shortly. It looks like we have a number of people joining us. Welcome, we will get started in just one more minute. It looks like we have a few more folks joining and I imagine we'll still have some others coming in the next few minutes, but we'll get started in about 30 seconds. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the South Atlantic Regional Event of the Energy Tech University Prize Competition, sponsored by the Office of Technology Transitions in the U.S. Department of Energy. My name is Deb Wojcik, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Executive Director of the Research Triangle Clean Tech Cluster, or RTCC. We are so excited to have you with us today to learn about the new and exciting energy technologies that our students have identified and hear from our student teams about their business plans to facilitate commercialization of these technologies. Please note that we are recording and will be sharing this session. And in fact, the bonus prize determinations are made based on this recording. So it is very important and we appreciate your understanding with this. So I'd first like to start by introducing you to your host organization, RTCC, today. Um, we at the Research Triangle Clean Tech Cluster are so excited to be serving as the South Atlantic Regional Convener and our second year of convening because this competition aligns so well with our vision and mission. We bring together industry, academia, and government leaders to advance the clean tech sector and economy here in North Carolina and beyond. As an organization, we do this through three main strategic goals. One is business development and collaboration. So bringing together the companies, municipalities, all those who really um, benefit from clean technology and are also the providers of it. We also work on innovation, promoting innovative technologies. If we could go back a slide, that would be great innovative technologies, as well as innovative business plans. And we facilitate education and talent. So education, we'll all be learning today, as well as talent, really building the workforce that we need to be able to innovate and deploy these technologies tomorrow. Lastly, I just wanted to point out that this competition really, really overlaps nicely with our clean energy systems uh, focus area. We also work on smart utility technologies and clean transportation. All of these will be highlighted in different ways during the student competition, and we're so excited about this alignment. So I'm going to take just a few minutes to provide everyone here with an overview of the competition itself. So as I said, this is sponsored by the Department of Energy. The Energy Tech University Prize competition is a collegiate competition that tasks student teams to develop and present a business plan using an emergency, emerging technology of their choice. So during our regional event tonight, we have 10 teams who will be pitching their plans. This challenge is unique among pitch competitions in that 
winners will be chosen on the strength of your business plans rather than individual team members' backgrounds. After we hear from all of the student teams, the judges will deliberate and identify our regional winner and runner-up that will be announced tonight at the end of the event. Our regional winner wins a $3,000 cash prize and will be invited to present at the National Pitch Competition in conjunction with the 2023 Energy Thought Summit Conference in Austin, Texas on April 2nd. They will there compete for a share of $100,000 in prize money. In addition to these, the regional prizes, we will also be identifying finalists for up to eight technology bonus prizes. These finalists will be reviewed by their respective offices at the Department of Energy, who will select one winner in each category. Winners of the National Bonus Prize competition will receive a $25,000 cash prize. In addition, our South Atlantic region has a now two-year tradition of having an Audience Choice Award. The student teams will be competing for the Audience Choice Award, and this is where webinar participants, you come in. If you attend at least half of the pitches today, you're welcome to vote for the Audience Choice Award at the end of the program. We do ask that you actually attend and listen to all of those so you can make the most informed choice possible. Please use the honor system. Audience members will be asked to select the one team you think exemplified the spirit of this competition best which team presented the best business plan to commercialize an energy technology innovation. The team with the most votes will be awarded $200 in gift cards to be divided among your group members. So how will this work? To overview how this will work, each team has five minutes and they will be kept to a strict five minutes to pitch. And then we will have up to four minutes for Q&A for each team. Questions will start with our esteemed judges, and then we will open up questions to the audience who are welcome. You are welcome to submit questions for the students using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You will not be coming off of mute to do that. We also have a one minute buffer built in as we transfer to the next team. So please remember that questions are meant to be for clarification from our students and not meant to be an opportunity for critique. This is a very positive and encouraging environment and we appreciate that. So the event overview, just wanna go over the agenda so everyone is on the same page as we start. About halfway through the pitches, we will have a 10 minute break. I think we might be on the next slide. Halfway through the pitches, we will have a 10 minute stretch break. Please make sure that you arrive back in time to watch the remainder of the pitches. Then after the end of the pitches, the judges will go into a separate room to deliberate. At that time, we will have two guest speakers join us to speak about careers in clean tech. We're excited to hear from Andrea Austin, Program Manager at Strategic Energy Innovations, and Estelle Fighter Blazer, a product manager for renewable energy and smart gas solutions for Census, a Xylem brand. We will then end the event before we announce the judges' final decisions with a student survey. We will share the audience choice award vote. We will, we will share the survey to get the audience choice award vote, and then we will come back together and announce our winners. So with no further ado, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our esteemed judges without whom this event would not be possible. We are honored to be joined by four individuals highly versed in technology innovation and commercialization. We're gonna start with Lisa. Lisa, if you could please introduce yourself to our student teams and attendees, then Damian, Jason, and Taylor. Absolutely, hi, my name is Lisa Bagwell and I am the Director of Field Application Engineering for the Electrification Business at ABB. Um, I have about 33 years in the electrical industry, and for those that aren't familiar with ABB, we are a, a global technology leader in electrification and automation, enabling a more sustainable and resource efficient future for all of us. Um, we connect our engineering know-how and our software to help optimize how things are manufactured, moved, powered, and operated in the industry. 
We are built on about 130 years of excellence. So we've been around a, a little while and uh, ABBs consists of about 105,000 employees. I am currently located in Cary, North Carolina and very active in STEM activities, supporting and mentoring engineering students. I sit on the Engineering Dean's Advisory Board, as well as a director on the Foundation Board at NAU, and am a director on the Diversity of Encompass Women Board at ABB. I'm uh, really glad to be here today and looking forward to all of the, the presentations. Thank Daniel? you so much, Lisa. Thanks so much, and Lisa. Um, yes, Deb. Oh, I just wanted to see if we still have the slides, if we could go ahead, because I think we have one for each. Is that true? Yeah. Well, thank you, Deb. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Lisa, wonderful introduction. Obviously, great to have you uh, contributing as a judge for this competition. Um, so my name is Damian Beauchamp. I'm President and Chief Development Officer here at Eight Rivers. I've been with the firm for seven years. Uh, I also serve as a member of the Board of Directors of Net Power. Uh, Eight Rivers uh, is, a, is an innovative uh, technology development company focused on process technologies for decarbonizing heavy industry. So we do things like new kinds of power plants for decarbonization, um, hydrogen generation, cement, direct air capture, um, steel, uh, industrial heat in general and process heat. So how do you take the hard to decarbonize sectors, uh, leverage today's commodities and hydrocarbons, but at the uh, end of the process, capture all associated emissions. Um, Net Power is a subsidiary that we founded. I serve on its board um, and that, that entity has been uh, uh, moving along nicely over the past uh, decade and, and we're really proud of it. Prior to joining Eight Rivers, I founded two companies, one in stationary energy storage, uh, which I actually competed uh, when I was in grad school in a competition very similar to this, uh, run through the DOE, uh, and ultimately won, won that year in 2015. Uh, and then founded another company in chemical inventory, leveraging visual recognition. Um, in, in grad school, studied chemistry, um, and uh, competitions like this, I believe, are very important uh, to uh, the educational process as well as technology development commercialization. Uh, so I'm very, very pleased to be joining everyone here today. And, and thank you for uh, asking me to, to help with this effort. And thank with you, that, Damian. Pass. Yeah, thank you so much, Damian. It is such a pleasure to have you with us. And Jason. If you could go next, please. Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, <laughs> tough acts to follow. Um, my name is Jason Massey. I'm co-founder, CEO of a company in downtown Raleigh called Industrial. Um, quick summary is we make energy management software and solutions for large industrial facilities. This includes everything from blast freezing chicken rest faster in cold storage facilities to large demand response programs for tire recycling facilities in, in Texas. Um, I'd like to say I had recently done a business plan competition like this when I was in college, but that would have been a lie. That was back in 1997, so quite a, quite a ways back. Um, but I will point out we found our CTO of our current company, Industrial, through business plan competitions just like this. So this is, I'll echo the sentiment of others. This is very fertile ground for talent and technology and, and um, people taking risk and trying things. So I'm, I'm humbled to be asked to, to be a judge in this. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Jason. We really appreciate it. And Taylor. Hi, I'm Taylor Moot. I work with RTI International, which is a nonprofit research institute. And within that, I'm part of the innovation advisors team, which does boutique innovation consulting, basically helping everybody understand how technologies can help solve their problems. 
Um, our group got started doing tech transfer for NASA back about 60 years ago and have expanded to working for big companies, small companies, government, nonprofits, things like that. And I spend a lot of my time doing tech to market analysis for various DOE projects. Before I was here, I uh, worked at a startup that was spun out of a national lab. And then I also did a postdoc at a different national lab. So I'm a big fan of the DOE and I'm really excited to see what everyone's come up with. Thank you so much to all of our judges. We are so honored to have their expertise and they have really tough work ahead of them because we will now move on to our virtual pitches. So I'll be turning over the uh, virtual podium to our first student team. Team one with students from the University of Virginia will be presenting their business plan on carbon capture through biomass cultivation. So I, Will our judges will remain on mute, but be visible. I am going to go on mute and I turn it over to you. How's it going guys? One sec. All right, I think we're good. All right, how's it going everyone? This is Binate Carbon Capture Through Biomass Cultivation. As for the team, I'm Kay Stevenson. I'm Gregory Perryman. I'm Tyler Kazmary. And then just going over the agenda. So first we're gonna start with context, which is our current problems and what binary cultivation is. Then we're gonna go into binate, our business model and what we do. Then we're gonna go into some market realities. Next, our process, so a commercialization timeline and then our overall takeaways. So starting off with context, we have the current carbon capture and photobioreactor problems. So current photobioreactors bio are high cost, have high mass transfers, a lot of scalability issues, and the need for high levels of additional nutrients during its life cycle. And current carbon capture industry is high cost, very energy intensive, high risk related to leakage and storage failure, and credits aren't really high quality or easily verifiable. So what is a photobioreactor? Essentially, it's a production facility uh, that uses uh, the photosynthetic process to produce algal biomass. Now, most uh, photobioreactors are monoculture systems, which means they use a single uh, species of algae biomass in order um, to create the entire biomass um, system. Sorry, now, team one. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I, if you believe you are sharing slides, you are not. Oh, oh. Well, <laughs> I'm so sorry. We are so sorry about that. Um, let us see. Um, okay. We can exit. Okay, press uh, share screen now. Share screen. Uh, sorry about that. We, we are so sorry. It's yeah, um, bad. All right. You want to go back to the previous slide? All right, go ahead. Go ahead. It looks like it's it looks like it's coming back. We're going to have to kind of hustle, so you may not okay. be able to use your slides for the first couple. But okay. Um, so essentially, the way the photobioreactor process works in binary cultivation is it u utilizes an in uh, a primary strand of algae and a secondary um, complementary strand in order to increase the efficiency uh, and the production of the primary autotrophic strand. The process works by intaking carbon dioxide and nutrients into the first step, where the autotroph in our system uh, sequesters carbon through natural photosynthetic processes and through calcification. Calcification produces a calcium carbonate um, solid, which is a, in, a solid, uh, insoluble, uh, inorganic form of carbon which is uh, harder to return to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, and therefore a more reliable form of carbon sequestration. In the second step, uh, the bacteria takes the excess oxygen in the system and returns some of it to carbon dioxide while also producing a high value nutraceutical byproduct. And then step one uh, occurs again and the process continues. Now, Binate operates in two distinct and growing markets. First, the global biomass market, which is expected to reach 55.6 billion. This is where we offer those high value nutraceuticals. And then second, the carbon capture and storage market, which is 
rapidly growing. I mean, the demand for carbon credits is expected to increase 15-fold in the next 10 years. And we're also planning to operate in this growing fast market. And so let's get to the economic feasibility. Binate, uh, one binate plant you could think of as the equivalent of an Olympic-sized swimming pool in volume. We expect to be able to produce between $1.8 and $2.1 million in revenue. You can see the profit figures there. Our three revenue streams are first the nutraceutical containing biomass, which is the bulk, massive bulk. And then we have a uh, range of revenue, which we can uh, gain from the credits uh, as the voluntary carbon credit market increases. And then we will also plan to spell the uh, excess carbonate byproduct that we make. And our capital costs, we have projected to be $8 million, and then our operational costs around $700,000 a year. And that, that ends our profit margin at 11%, and we'll be happy to answer questions about this. But our commercialization timeline is important because first we would need to do the IP licensing for PNLL. Then we will move into raising debt and equity in round run in order to build a pilot plant, which is a proof of concept, before we got to uh, round two and our expansion uh, at scale. And so what's really important is that Binate is leading the transition, first by strengthening regional supply chains, which means bringing together biomass cultivation and hard to decarbonize industries. And then also by reducing pollutants and, and mitigating the climate impacts in vulnerable communities. We align with the DOE's Justice 40 communities by providing jobs and economic opportunity and through our carbon capture sequestration and then biomass production. We have been Binate. Uh, thank you for bearing with us, and we're ready to take your questions. Thank you. That wins for recovery. Very good adaptability there. Judges, if you... I think you're cutting out a little bit. Sorry. I am... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I apologize for that. Um, judges, go ahead and ask your questions. So, uh, Damien here. Um, first question is: so, so what is what is the current plan for deployment of the first unit? How would you be plan to to do that? So. Our first steps would definitely be financing. And this comes into a big debate over equity or like debt financing. But our whole goal in the end is to have kind of a system where it's actually a lease or buy of the technology in the plant. So we're thinking that uh, the companies we're pairing with will take a small percentage of the upfront costs in creating the actual facility because at the end of the day, we're actually going to be benefiting them. But as for actual first round and first initial like investments, we're definitely thinking more of the equity route because you know there's not much uh, proof behind this concept at the moment. So really, you can't get banks to debt finance us as easily for that part. Have you guys identified any grants or applied for any grants related related to this? Is is probably maybe a funding source for your pilot plants. Yeah, so we're still in the very early stages, and so that would be one of our next steps for sure. And, and what would be the throughput from your plant? I, I saw it $7 million for one plant. What would be your throughput? Yeah, so, um, to give you a better idea, um, you I, I don't know if you guys got a, enough time to kind of look at this, but we did, we did several kind of analysis. First, we uh, did a projection. Uh, we did an MPV uh, to establish that present value. So uh, through looking at that, we estimated our cash flow uh, to be between uh, 1.8 and 2.1 million dollars per year for the for the first plant. And so that it, um, it, and you can kind of see how the breakdown goes there. And then we did an estimation of actually doing 50 percent on debt and in the um, and established our discount rate, and we were able to uh, kind of figure out what would the payback cost be on that capital cost, and then factor in the operational, and that's kind of how we ended up with the um, the profit metric per year. Um, I hope that answers your question. Do you have a follow up, but maybe some of this could be clearer? No, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
And what's this, uh, what's this biomass? I'm sorry, what's the biomass that's produced used for? There we go. Oh. Uh, so when you refer to biomass, you're referring to the actual algae itself, correct? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so we plan to, um, depending on the market rates for the algae we're producing, uh, either sell it into the market or repurpose it um, in our reactors um, as we grow. Do you want to talk about this there? Yeah. Um, so the, the other byproduct that's created is this high value nutraceutical. And because at first the carbon credit market isn't isn't currently ready um, to sustain a project like this um, in terms of uh, economic costs. Uh, the the current sustainer in our business model is uh, this Estaxin byproduct, which produces a high source of revenue for the company. Yeah, and so essentially we'd be able to plug in uh, different strains of algae, uh, different bacterium and on the uh, heterotrophic side and then on the autotrophic side to produce different bottle byproducts. But uh, one of the high value nutraceuticals we wanted to highlight was the cystaxin, which you can see the different uses in pharmaceuticals. Um, this is really where the, the biomass market is at as far as uh, cultiv uh, biomass cultivation using photobioreactors. Thank you, team. Are you able to hear me this way? Yes. yes. Good. Okay, great. I am using many devices. I appreciate that. Thank you, Team One, for your hard work and your presentation. We're now going to transition to Team Two. Let's make sure that we can get that screen sharing up and we'll get started. So Team Two, Water Ram Pump, please take it away. And we see your slides, but they are in the mode where we can see all of your slides. So you may oh. want to put it in presentation mode. Let's see. Yeah. Um, how's that work for you? Great. Okay. Let's get started. Perfect. Um, actually, before we get started, I do have a quick question for um, everyone, um, and that is, do, does anybody believe that gravity can be defied? If so, please speak up. Perfect. It sounds like nobody's speaking up. Um, and I'm sorry to break you, to you, we haven't defied gravity. Um, however, when we tell people that we can pump water uphill without any electrical energy input, that's, that's what they think of. My name's Kyle, and I'm with the Water Ramp Pump team. Pump storage makes up about 93% of US energy storage, but doesn't come without some issues. Some of these issues include being a net energy consumer, reservoir filling being restricted to certain times of the day when energy prices are low, as well as low impact design standards have not yet been created, making power purchasers apprehensive about, about long-term contracts with these facilities. Our solution is a water ram pump system uh, to fill pump storage facilities and reservoirs. A water ram pump works in four simple steps. Water flows down the drive pipe and enters into the pump itself. It forces the waste valve shut due to an increase in, di in dynamic pressure. This causes the water hammer effect and water hammer pressure, then pushing water up the delivery pipe. Once this pressure has become stagnant, um, static pressure is less than the dynamic pressure, allowing the waste valve to fall back open and the cycle will just continually repeat itself. This is a known technology used in agriculture and rural communities, however, has not yet been applied to pump storage facilities. Our customers are current and future pump storage facility owners and operators. Currently, there's 22 gigawatts of pump storage in the United States with about 50 uh, sorry, 22 yeah, gigawatts and with about 50 gigawatts um, currently in the permitting stage right now. One avenue for earning our customers' business is through a bidding on pump storage projects as a subcontractor under larger engineering firms. Our competitors range from small one-person businesses selling ram pumps for house irrigation systems to large corporations like General Electric Renewable Energy who offer dual directional pumps used in pump storage facilities. In the case of these large companies, they're restricted on pumping when, when energy prices are low. 
Additionally, we have filed a provisional patent for the use of water ram pumps and um, in pump storage and hydropower facilities to inhibit our competitors moving into this market space. Pumping and water use takes up about 25% of pump storage operation and maintenance costs. This accounts for $1.2 million for an average current facility and $5.5 million for an average future facility per year. We offer two main services. These are the physical pump systems themselves and then a 15 year service and maintenance contract. Installation is free, so our customers see a return on their investment immediately. We receive payment via a percent of generation revenue. Over the first year, this is 11%, and then years two through 15, that is 5%. This allows us to recuperate the cost of installation within the first year. Our system costs depend on a number of, um, on a number of factors, including capacity, elevation, plant usage, and proximity to natural bodies of water. But for an average current facility, this is it would cost about five hundred thousand to one point four million dollars to install. Our potential impacts are helping governments achieve their carbon neutrality goals, removing uh, or allowing reservoir filling at all times, as opposed to when energy costs are low, and then also being an environmentally friendly uh, alternative to current pumps means facilities with our technology will be minimally impacted by future low impact design standards, making power purchase agreements easier to come by. And finally, simply reducing pump storage operation and maintenance costs. It all starts with our personnel. We've identified three teams we need to be successful, the engineering, sales, and administrative team. We've identified that we'll use manufacturing contracts until we can build our own manufacturing facility, um, and then also regional pipe construction contracts. Our people and our facilities will help us achieve our 15-year goals of a 3% US market penetration and 1% world market penetration. In summary, we are bringing water ram technology to hi the hydropower industry. And while we aren't defying gravity, we are transitioning pump storage facilities and technology to the future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Kyle and team two. We can go ahead and get started with our judges questions. Hey, hey Kyle, just a, uh, a question. Uh, is, is somebody providing this today? Who would be your competitor? Uh, so competitors, um, so nobody's actually using RAM pumps within the pump storage facilities. Um, that's going to be like General Electric or some of these other larger um, pump companies that create the dual directional pumps, which allows uh, pump water up and then also turns into a turbine and allow it to flow back down. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. D have you guys built uh, maybe a smaller morphology or form factor demo unit? I'm so glad you asked. Um, so these are a couple of units that I actually installed myself on a farm um, in Kentucky that they're using for irrigation. Um, so this is a, a unit that's being sold right now for um, small farms, agricultural uses right now. I did actually build my own um, out of just some equipment from Home Depot as well. Um, and that is that would be our next phase in terms of uh, moving to, towards commercialization because I can run all the Bernoulli's equations um, that that I want to, um, but we're going to need to do some testing and actually find out what are the the different metrics and um, how does how does um, some of these different pipe materials affect um, the actual output um, and flow rates of these of these pumps. So um, another question. When, when you talk about competition, obviously you understood the, the process of, of selling these into smaller scale applications and then getting bigger over time. Um, good model to be able to self-generate revenue near term without having to sell too much equity. So certainly appreciate that. Um, but as, as you look at the larger scale units um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, just trying to get a sense of of rate of pumping of water, uh, yeah. you know, so rate of pumping, estimated capex for the larger scale units, and then if you have done any levelized cost of mm -hmm. of energy storage, on like a kilowatt hour basis or anything like this. Yeah, so I've not done any specific um, levelized cost of, of pump storage facilities using a water ram pump itself. 
um, okay. just from the cost savings that I mentioned before. Um, and then the, the first part of the question asked is, it, it sounds like, is there a flow rate? Is there enough flow rate with these facilities or with these pumps? Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, and yeah, for, for one pump, um, probably not, but we're going to use these pumps um, in, in a parallel and you can link up their supply pipes all together um, to increase the flow rate that you need. Um, so while you'll be restricted on the amount of pressure because water hammer produces a lot of pressure, um, that's where you can decrease that pressure if you use multiple pumps in, in parallel. Um, and then also you can also increase your flow rates um, as well to get the water as however fast you need to the reservoir. Additionally, for pump storage facilities, they need to refill their water within 24 hours, um, as opposed to uh, what they're doing right now is they're just slugging a bunch of water off of um, a natural body of water right now. Um, and that can create a lot of environmental effects. So if we can refill this uh, pump storage reservoir over a you know, a 24 hour period, the environmental effects are going to be less, which can help with some of those power purchasing agreements and meeting those low impact design standards when they come out. When, when you referenced your average size unit and mm -hmm. you referenced CapEx on that, I mean, what rate of pumping is that average size unit that you referenced in the presentation, I guess? Um, that is, uh, I would have to, I'd have to double check the calculations. It's based on 144 megawatt facility that okay. runs eight hours um, and is, has a 17% use um, per, per month. Um, and so that's we, all we have time for. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle and team two. We're gonna move on now to team three, Biocharm, the pursuit of carbon negative concrete from Appalachian State University. Take it away. All right, thank you. We'll just get our screen shared here. There we go. Is everything coming up okay? Yes. Yes. All right, great. Well, we're ready for that timer whenever you are. All right, well, thank you and hello, everybody. Um, today, we'll be representing Appalachian State University, and it is our pleasure to introduce you to our business, Biocharm Supply and Consulting. Now, the cement production industry contributes heavily to national and international carbon footprints, making up a total of 8% global CO2 emissions. And in order to reduce this massive footprint, it is imperative that new technology be introduced to the construction sector. Thankfully, Biocharm is introducing a groundbreaking process to significantly reduce carbon emissions, First, we public or first, sorry, we partner with public landfills to obtain a small plot of on-site property in order to easily collect viable food and wood waste, which together make up 29.9% of all municipal solid waste landfilled annually in the US. Second, we convert the biomass into biochar through pyrolysis, sequestering up to 2.2 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of biochar produced and reducing the emissions from that initial waste stream. Now, once the biochar is ground into a fine powder, it is capable of being used as a supplementary cementitious material, replacing the use of cement in concrete by up to 15% and reducing the carbon footprint of that concrete by up to 44.5%. Thank you, Robert. So Biocharm has two main revenue streams. First, we work closely with architects and engineers to ensure compliance with ASTI, ACI, and state regulations and then supply subcontractors with the necessary amount of biochar to support their projects. Second, sequestering carbon dioxide through the production of biochar allows us to generate and sell carbon credits in the voluntary carbon markets in the US. After certification with a recognized carbon standards program, the paralysis reactors we plan to use manufactured by a company out of Iowa called RT contain an automated carbon credit tracking and calculation system that allows us to seamlessly register with a carbon offset registry, such as the ACR or VERA, and sell our carbon credits. According to allied market research, the market for supplementary cementitious materials in the US was evaluated at 3.5 billion in 2020 and is projected to reach 6.8 billion by 2030. Similarly, the growth of voluntary carbon markets in the US is expected to increase exponentially over the next 10 years, with a potential supply of carbon credits in the neighborhood of 8 to 12 gigatons per year by 2030, about a third of which fall into the nature-based sequestration category where biochar, where biochar is housed. Currently, this market is being served by fly ash, GGBS, and silica fume, all of which are byproducts of carbon-intensive processes. However, these materials are becoming scarcer, 
which will increase the need for locally available, cost-effective, and more sustainable SCMs, which Biocharm can provide. By reaching out to design and construction firms already using SCMs in their concrete and educating them on the benefits of using biochar, we hope to secure customers for our product. This customer base primarily includes public construction projects in the counties we operate in, as well as both green building certified construction projects and any commercial project focused on decreasing their carbon footprint. Thank you, Clayton. Our financial calculations were performed using data provided by Artie, the company supplying our pyrolysis reactors. These reactors are fully automated, which decreases operating costs such as propane due to the ability to recycle the syngas produced back into the reactor. In addition, leasing land from public landfills allows for minimal transportation and material acquisition costs, while providing the landfill with additional revenue and waste management. Although we have the option of going with a single train reactor in locations with lower supplies of biomass, our intention is to begin with the three train option to improve profitability and ensure a stable supply of biochar. The revenue is calculated based on our biochar being sold at $350 per ton and each carbon credit being valued at $25 per ton. With higher rates of CO2 reduction and a lower rate of replacement, $350 is cost competitive comparatively. Once the equipment is paid off in a little over two years, each location will bring in an estimated profit of $547,000 per year allowing us to acquire enough capital in five years of operation to begin expanding to other locations. We begin with locations in three states, which have been selected based on the highest amount of wood waste coinciding with the highest number of new building permits issued. Each location is capable of producing enough biochar to supply around two Empire State buildings worth of biochar concrete at a 10% replacement rate. Although we plan to operate mainly in public construction for the first year, we hope to build relationships with commercial building firms over a five-year period, eventually becoming dedicated commercial suppliers of biochar. After 10 years and an array of successful implementations of biochar concrete, our next focus will be to partner with a retail ready-mix supply company to produce a green line available on the shelves of home improvement stores with the goal of becoming national distributors of concrete, biochar concrete and contributing heavily in the transition to more sustainable building materials. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you, team. We can go ahead and have questions. It looks like Jason, you've come off mute. Yeah, I'm excited about this particular market. Um, um, actually, two questions. Do you have like an LCID landfill partner lined up um, for, for this? And then I think the deeper question is a lot of this is off the shelf kind of technology. Um, what would you say is your kind of core differentiator of, of pulling all this together and, 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 and turning it into something? So uh, we haven't identified any landfills specifically, but in our target states, we have identified five landfills as candidate landfills uh, being some of the largest in the state um, that we were looking at. And um, we haven't spoken directly with any of them, but uh, we have looked into what landfills we uh, would be going into and how much waste they have. And then what was your second question again? I mean, it, it feels very like a system integration play with some off the shelf technology. What, what would you say is your particular uh, differentiator here? Well, uh, I mean, a lot of biochar production is, is, as you know, specifically for agriculture. So I think, um, it's very new in the realm of, of being a supplementary cementitious material. And um, as far as differentiating us from other SCMs, um, biochar is a lot more, uh, is not as, is actually carbon negative inherently in a process while as the other SCMs uh, are byproducts of very carbon intensive processes. In addition, most of the companies that currently work on uh, selling biochar they're not quite as profitable due to their transportation and material acquisition costs specifically being extremely high. So by partnering with public landfills, uh, we hope to completely negate that problem. Maybe kind of pulling on that thread a little bit more. I'm curious, you know, you have has said a lot of benefits of why you would might want to partner with landfills to get the food and the wood, but are there other potential places you could put these that you think might be good fits that you would target down the line or something like that? Or um, I think landfills are probably our best option just because that's kind of the, the hub of where the, 
all the waste is flowing into rather than us having to go out and and seek biomass and waste from locations where uh, it's kind of coming to us in a way which just like Daniel said reduces uh, one of the major costs in the production of biochar which is the gathering the biomass itself and once we become more profitable we can also implement higher scaled or uh, larger scale plants um, to ensure that our uh, supply is, is meeting our demand. We have time for one more question. Great, if we don't have questions, we can also take them from the audience, but I don't see any in the Q&A right now. I will give it another five seconds. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you, everybody. We, yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for continuing these great presentations. We're now going to move on to team four, using solar energy for a more sustainable world, back to the University of Virginia. Take it away. Team four. We see your slides. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Bethany, and I am with using sustainable, um, using solar energy for a more sustainable world. And this is our marketization of perovskite solar cells and 21st century solar panels. Uh, there we go. Um, unfortunately, my teammates cannot be with me today. But like I said earlier, my name is Bethany Baysmore, and I'm a third year systems engineering student here at the University of Virginia. Just for a quick rundown of the presentation, um, we will be, I will be discussing the technology, the market plan and feasibility and the overall impact of this business plan. Did you know that solar energy only makes up 2.8% of total energy use in the United States? When I was researching this problem, this was something that came very shocking to me since solar energy is one of the most abundant renewable resources we have. Um, this can be due for a lot of reasons, um, particularly lack of public knowledge, lack of political backing, and the technology itself capabilities. And through our business plan, we plan to address all three of these. So after some research, we found that the answer lies in an emerging technology that improves the major downside of solar panels, which is perovskite solar cells. Um, currently, the industry standard is um, silicon, and while it is super durable, its efficiency is only 10 to 15 percent. With perovskites, in both of these fashions here seen on the screen, we see that this efficiency improves upwards of 25 percent. Now transitioning onto the market plan and feasibility. So using a system thinking approach, we were able to analyze the current market and identify our customer. So currently as the market stands right now, the market is currently dominated by silicon-based cells, which is durable, like I mentioned prior, but lacks that um, efficient capability. And additionally to that too, the market price for residential installment is extremely expensive. So looking forward to the future, ideally this market would have a big mixture of both technologies available. However, perovskite solar panels would win in the long term since the market price would be a lot cheaper and accessible to more people. So from this market analysis, we were able to create two user groups that our plan could effectively target. User one would be the novice who is not well familiar with solar panels and might be looking to enter the energy transition, um, looking for alternative methods to power their home. And user two would be someone who is well versed, however, is looking for a more efficient alternative or might be looking into other renewable sources for their residents. So our business plan would be successful if we could offer two services, particularly the installation based on consulting on client needs and the installation itself, as well as the maintenance. So dealing with the removal at end of life and looking into potential reapplication methods. So in terms of economic feasibility, customers will be willing to pay the price it costs for long-term savings. Um, currently, right now, um, in the state of Virginia, solar panel installations cost around $15,000 after federal tax, tax credits. Our price right now, after calculating some numbers, was around $13,000, and that's before federal tax 
credits. So we would see this price come down even further. Um, in terms of benefit to the consumer, we would see a yearly savings of over $1,500 and um, a rate of return in 10 years. And also something that is most notable is the fact that property value actually goes up when solar panels are on the house. And cost of business right now, single junction perovskite cells are $32 per square meter. And for the tandem option, it's 113. And for the cost of our startup would be around 560,000 to $1 million. And the benefit to our business would be the ability to match profit margins of competitors, which is around four to 7%. And lastly, I wanna talk about the business impact beyond profits, because I think at the end of the day, it's important to show how this technology will shape other people's lives. So many people will actually have the opportunity to to gain both grid and financial independence with this plan. So referring back to those two use cases that I mentioned prior, user one and user two see completely opposite um, benefits from engaging with our profit. However, I think the most unique opportunity with our business plan for the client is that they have the ability to gain financial independence from the electric companies and also opportunities to make revenue from their investment. And our role in the energy transition as a business will be key as it provides equitable opportunity and sustainable growth. So in terms of equity, we will allow our services to be provided through green banks, meaning that more people, particularly people of lower socioeconomic status will have access to this opportunity. And in terms of sustainability, implementing elements of design into our product so we can extend the life of the product. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bethany. Let's get started with questions. I just wanted to ask a clarification question. It seemed like a lot of your um, business case was based on the ability to install these easily or more easily than what's currently being installed. But I think I missed why perovskites enable that specifically. Okay, so I can speak to how that is easier. Um, perovskite solar cells are unique in the sense that it is not super, um, in comparison to silicon, which is the current standard, um, it doesn't take as much to manufacture. Much of the price of solar panels um, comes from the cells that are used. So I looked at some numbers in 40% of the solar panel costs come from the cells itself. So silicon right now is currently very expensive because it is a finite resource um, in comparison to perovskite cells, which can be grown at low temperatures, which makes it more accessible. What, what would you, who would you say your, your main competition is? Um, right now, I did a lot of this modeling based off First Solar, um, who is a company based in Arizona, as all of you know, um, who is kind of the leader in this industry right now in terms of not using silicone as their main product in their solar cells, in their solar panels. Um, so interesting topic. Uh, you I worked on perovskites and disensitized solar cells as well. Um, so all these topics are great today, but do not waste time. Um, where do you plan to source the perovskite from um, as the material? Um, currently, um, right now, it is pretty much um, centered in labs right now. So looking long-term, um, we would hopefully do that in the US. Um, have some business ventures of sourcing in the U.S. Um, I think the unique thing about um, sourcing in the U.S. is that not only it gives the United States as a whole on a systemic level a level of energy independence from other countries, so ideally we would try to source in the country. And any toxicity issues or concerns that you have with perovskites, if so, what? Um, yes, so perovskites, um, the most common form, which is known for um, as for its highest efficiency does have lead in it. However, technology um, is being used to work on the encompassment, encomp like encompassing the technology, also to make it more weather resistant. And that was what I was referring to in elements of design by disassembly. So making sure as a business, we take the initiative to remove those in a way that is safe for people. And what's your background? What's your education? Focus. Mine? Yeah. Um, I'm a third year University of Virginia student in systems and engineering with a minor in engineering business and global sustainability, and I'm on the accelerated master's track in systems. Got it. Thank you. One last uh, quick question for you. 
the um, the profit margin four to seven percent, you know, pretty slim from a profitability standpoint. So you were saying that this is easier to install. It's it's cheaper. Have you thought about or did you guys think about um, price in the market? Um, yes. Um, however, I would take this company more in a B Corp direction. So not necessarily being a thousand percent profit driven. Yes, this is a business competition, but at the end of the day, this is more about like sustainability and those initiatives as well. And first solar is actually at 4% as of 2022. So by following that model, I think that's very important and that we keep sight while making profits, but keep sight of what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bethany and your team. We're gonna move on to team five. So oh, team sorry. five, Edina Energy, and I may not have said that as you wish. So it's you all good. It um, I can't share my video, is that okay? Because it says I can't share it because the host has stopped me. Um, okay, stop my video. Okay, let me. We can see you now. Oh, awesome. No. Um, can my team hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, can you guys yeah, see the timer? Oh, awesome. Awesome. Let me. Thank uh, you, Team Five. Okay, um, we are ready when you guys are ready to start the timer. Cool. So, Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Hunter, and I'm the founder of Edenic Energy, and we are on a mission to make buildings better in underserved communities. And this is because 75% of Black and Brown people are more likely to live in highly polluted and low-income environments. And in general, these buildings contribute to about 38% of the total U.S. carbon emissions. And we also know that there's 122 million outdated buildings, typically in underserved areas, that use 75% of the total U.S. US electricity and cost building owners 400 billion annually. But unfortunately, one third is wasted every single year. And this is because the process of greening buildings is super, super complicated. With a lot of stakeholders and options at the table, we found that building owners frequently encounter setbacks, and we know that they need a different approach. That approach is Edenic Energy. Think of Google Home or Google Nest, but for commercial buildings and spaces. We simply connect our software and our hardware solution to buildings so we can identify, design, and manage energy efficient and operational improvements. So this would how it would work. Uh, let's take a prior project in Portsmouth, Virginia, which involves a predictive analytics software. It can maximize energy and operational efficiency in commercial buildings and collect building data to create a digital footprint, process it to control building energy systems and execute energy models with the use of IoT devices to optimize energy usage. So all of this would be accomplished with AI, ML, and cloud computing technology while providing the data to utility companies to help them make better decisions at the edge. Demand response would also be improved by balancing energy demand and supply, and the technology would be made to create a better communication between the building owner and the utility companies. So I'm Shreya, I'm the head of engineering and technology. I'm currently pursuing my master's in energy management and I have a background in electrical engineering. Hello everyone, my name is Thomas Hunter and I'm the founder and CEO, and I study engineering technology at DeVry University. Hello everyone, my name is Paulina Oricon. I'm head of communications. I'm currently getting my master's in energy management at UTD and I have a background in geosciences. Hi everyone, I'm Danisha and I'm the chief financial officer. I have a ba background in business and finance and I'm currently pursuing a master's in energy management. Hello, I'm Christopher, I'm head of data and I'm currently pursuing a bachelor's in IT. So our team knows how to penetrate huge markets like the construction industry. Our target market is the global retrofit and smart building market where combined they spend 222 billion annually. Since we know there are 5 million commercial buildings in the US that are super outdated, typically in underserved communities, we will launch our software in the Portsmouth, Virginia region, a disadvantaged community where we already have traction. And our current go-to-market strategy that has been successful and proven initial market penetration is connecting with our channel partners and our accelerator networks to reach building owners. Our monthly subscription model makes financing easy for building owners, and with a low barrier to entry, they can start energy implementations now. And for building owners ready with complete projects, we deliver financing through our shared energy savings model. 
We offer these services in the form of our three-tier model, ranging from a free subscription to energy savings per square feet area. We aim to do so by shifting our focus to 5% of the 5 million available commercial buildings. Thus, over a span of 10 years, we are projected to be a $600 million company catering to 250,000 buildings in the market, as seen on the graph. Not only do we want to measure our financial gains, but we are also committed to evaluating our impact on the community and the environment, which we center on three key deliverables driven by the Justice 40 initiative. These are emissions reduction, economic development, and health improvement, all specifically focused on the minority population of Portsmouth, Virginia, and eventually the Southwest region. With our current business model, we aim to reduce CO2 emissions by 40% in our target area within one to five years of operations, which will amount to approximately 200 tons of CO2. We also project that we can create 1,000 plus jobs within the Portsmouth minority market in the energy efficiency space. Lastly, we aim to impact the health and living conditions of over 48,000 people, which make up the minority and over 52% of the total population in Portsmouth by reducing their energy poverty and climate volume. We asked today is to advance to nationals and become the winner of the Grid Technologies Bonus Prize in conjunction with mentorship from the P Department of Energy. So guys, we know that it's environmental inclusion that will unlock the energy transition to improve the well-being for all. So we ask you guys to join us and together we can build paradise. Thank you. Thank you, team. How much, um, what's the upfront cost to install meters, any sensors, data integrations with building control system? What, what's the initial, initial fee typically? Absolutely. So since we are focusing on the Portsmouth region, um, the Portsmouth region has uh, grant funding and they have certain funding for building owners in minority and disadvantaged communities. So the, they have some upfront costs that they allow um, us to access or upfront grants for us to access. But also we have about five different grants that we are looking to get that's totaling about 6.5 million this year. And with that, we uh, plan to buy IoT devices and sensors since they're very, very cheap um, at scale. We, Sorry, we, I missed this. I I'm, we're having a massive storm outside, so I keep on getting distracted by the wind. But uh, <laughs> it's all good. I think, yeah, I would just like to dig in a little bit on sort of like who your first customers would be. I know you mm -hmm. mentioned it at high level, but I'm, I'm trying to think, understand of like what. Yeah, if you've identified any. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So we're right now, currently we're doing a pilot project and we are focusing on 20,000 square foot to about 100,000 square foot. And it's focused on mixed use space and commercial space and underserved communities. Typically these buildings are ran down, they're dumb buildings. <laughs> so we're trying to make them smart buildings. So our goal is to focus on around 20,000 square foot to about 100,000 square foot. Um, the small to medium sized market, where building owners or operators have a small team um, where we can implement our technology. And, and are you considering yourself like a one-stop shop? So you would, you, would in, you would purchase all the meters and equipment necessary and install it and maintain it? Absolutely. So our really our goal is to get the building owner to engage on our platform. And this has nothing to do with hardware or anything like that. Our goal is to get the building owner to access our software and our dashboard platform just to organize all their building data. We did about 170 customer discovery uh, meetings and a lot of these building owners have blueprints, they have paperwork, they have Google drives, they have all this paperwork about their, their building information, but it's all over the place. So our goal is to get it into one spot. And then once we do that, we can analyze the data and take them to the next step, which is actually analyzing their building using IoT devices. And then from there, we're able to do energy efficient improvements if the building owner wants to get to that point. Our goal is just to meet the building owner where they're at. So I think it's a super interesting idea to pick up and, and aggregate uh, data that's currently disparate in various forms. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then obviously being able to provide that as an upfront, uh, no cost service, then creates a bit of a, a link uh, to you all mm -hmm. and a necessity to move forward. Mm -hmm. but so, so what's your, in, in thinking about footprints of buildings, what's your customer acquisition cost? So, and what I think about is your acquisition cost for a customer is to do that upfront analysis. What, what do you think that costs from a team perspective? Absolutely. Uh, the, the cost up front um, will be in the hundred thousands and that's just hiring teams and uh, hiring personnel. Um, but once we, you know, validate our algorithms, which we already have, the algorithms can actually scale to building to building using public data. So uh, essentially, as the time goes on, costs wouldn't really be a factor up front. Um, and our goal is just to get the building owner to pay monthly to pay that upfront cost with the IoT devices. Thank you. That brings us to the conclusion of team five. And we will now take a break. We have nine minutes. We will start promptly at 515 and you will hear uh, some music play towards the end of that time, signaling you to come back. So please join us again at 515.
We're going to get started very shortly. If everyone can please make their way back. Thank you everyone for making your way back. I see our, I see three of four judges. Taylor, if you happen to be off camera, but there you could jump back on, that would help me. Ah, there we go. And we will be starting the second portion of our pitches with team six, efficient solar hybrid PV thermal panel and system. Team six, if you wanna start sharing and get started. You should be able to hear me and see me, uh, but I don't have a pitch timer. It blurred out during the break. I don't know if everybody else is. Yeah, Paul, give me one second. My Zoom crashed when I tried to play music to bring everybody back in, so I'm having to the time. So give me. me well, we appreciate that. So right. you're seconds. forgiven on the tech problem. <laughs> Serves us right for trying to make it a party. Too. Way to go, other teams. Uh, really enjoyed. Glad I caught the first half. I'll go ahead and set up the share while we're getting the timer working, if that's okay. Yep. Looks like you're good to go, Paul. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. All right, I will, first I wanna plant some questions in back of your head before I go through a bunch of slides. Uh, what if I? What if you could get the energy uh, from six PV panels in one panel? Or how about if you had enough energy for your electricity, hot water, et cetera, all of your energy needs, and it had built-in storage so that you could sell back to the grid when it's high and make your own electricity, heat, et cetera. How about if it was smart and knew when to melt snow versus when to just chill out? So anyway, hey, help me save the planet. And well, for some reason I'm not advancing on slides. There we go. We'd like to say uh, spanning the spectrum in solar energy so what we're talking about is both the electromagnetic and the market. Uh, we're picking up more of the spectrum because we're a hybrid panel. And what we want to do is go from small to large on the market. This entire idea was built from energy justice and doing a um, three acre transportation oriented development without burning anything. So there's an acre of garage rooftop there that I needed a solar panel. So I shop for quite some time and eventually do a sketch, which pretty much hijacked my life, brought me back to school <laughs> in energy science and engineering. And 
don't let this overwhelm you. Just look at the dotted lines, please. The inner dotted line is the system. The outer dotted line is a, maybe like a campus, uh, some type of economic entity. Uh, main thing is dollar signs, energy coming in from the sun, and energy going out and being shared everywhere else. There is IP. It's down here in this corner. That's the sketch that I drew that pretty much took my life in a whole new direction. This is the uh, summary on the tech. The first bullet points are that the panels, uh, both types, thermal and PV, work better when cooled. Uh, the next three bullet points have to do with uh, creating jobs in uh, high volume manufacturing. And the other portions are where we distribute the manufacturing into small shops so that we preserve local jobs while we create additional local jobs. So heat pump technologies, we all like that. That way I get the Delta T I need so I don't have to pump so hard. It all fits together great. It's uh, smart because it's got AI and all that built in, it knows the weather. Uh, we've got a couple of demonstration sites lined up. One is uh, up in uh, near Chicago area, uh, 42 North. Uh, this one here is 38 North uh, Desert Southwest, Colorado. So from a customer's perspective, we say saving money always with renewable technology. Okay, we've looked at a lot of different things. This is the pain point for our customer, and that's basically writing a check, especially with the affordability and paying for something that's bad for people and planet. So we're lower cost by design. We're building in the mass production of the parts and then being able to assemble those uh, locally and then install those locally as well. So now, instead of writing a check, you're receiving a check. So we box this in to get an idea uh, with a 3% typical on a PV installation, we're gonna get 30% return Okay, now there's enough there to share. So not necessarily all for the customer, but the business model flies. We've looked at our competition. We've looked at where the market's heading. When we look at just a quarter of, of we're at 75 million US panels. So we've looked at our competitors, our path. We've looked at our business model, how we can do the distributed manufacturing, create jobs all over. Uh, when we lay everything out with the spreadsheets and look at the five-year, we can make it if we can get some help. <laughs> so anyway, that's it. Thank you. Can you um, talk a little bit more about the technology component of it? If I understood correctly, it's cooling of solar panels. Is it integrated in one system? Uh, in that same footprint of a PV panel, I'm going to get that same, well, actually, I'm going to get a lot more electricity. If you look at the chart on the right, that's where panels have the thermal coefficient of performance. So I can take a panel that's a, say, a 15% uh, rated panel, and by cooling it those uh, 40 degrees, it's gonna be a 25% efficient panel. Not only that, I'm going to hold it there. So on a hot day when the air is still and the panel's heating up to 105 degrees, not in this case. Now that panel would be a 5% efficient panel at that point. This one's gonna stay at 25. Plus I get all the heat on the other side of the heat pump. Hot water, take that shower, you know. So what what would be the incremental like per kW cost to to add this cooling function to what sounds like off the shelf? I, I, I'm talking about like a uh, like an LCOE or something like along those lines. So solar is um, running under three three cents a kilowatt hour now. So uh, installed, uh, but what we did was we took our competitors and we looked at their margins and uh, their prices, their costs, and then boxed ourselves in by looking at which were the common parts 
we built our margin that way based on uh, what would you pay for this versus other. Uh, plus, uh, we took the pricing latitude, brought the price down, still left ourselves good margin, and um, uh, that's where what how everything was built. If that helps answer the question, we don't have an exact uh, like a number. One thing we did find out though is that the math falls apart for LCOE. Uh, for the levelized cost of energy, that's a producer math set. So that would be like the utility looking at what it would cost them. Uh, on the consumer side, on your rooftop, you're going to get savings by offsetting your um, your energy needs, uh, both fossil and electric. And then uh, you would additionally, you're going to get a check by delivering electricity to the grid. If you happen to be in a thermal district, which I hope more of us get to do over time, then you could also sell your heat therms. Add more panels, sell more electricity. Yeah, there's more room. One of the biggest problems, our, our former governor, Bredesen here, has told us that one of his biggest problems with his uh, solar company is having enough space on the roof to even break even. We're talking about way beyond break even. You're going to become a producer with this system. And is this primarily more for what I call consumer residential, or are you looking to also put this into more commercial aspects? We want to do this anything from a skyscraper, a municipal district energy, all the way down to tiny home. Uh, so while we're doing district energy to bring in the money on the front end, uh, large projects, almost like a consulting firm would, that's going to fund the development of the uh, what we call the tiny home deployment where the, the, our system pretty much eliminates all the different appliances and uh, re, your refrigerator, everything just couples in with the system. And then we'll, what we wanna do is then close in on all the rest. So trailer homes, trailer parks can have a central. I'm out, okay. Thank you. Thank you, team six. We'll now move on to team seven. Recon from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. All right, can everyone see my slides? Yes, you're ready. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Franklin. Um, I'm joined today by my teammates, Hamada, uh, Amin, and Kyung Ki. Simply put, Recon is an innovative building integrated technology, PV technology, uh, that reconfigures circuit connections in order to increase electricity generation um, by up to 90%. Um, solar energy is rapidly growing in the US. Um, of US annual additions to new electric generating capacity, it made up 46%. However, uh, to meet uh, decarbonization goals, uh, this capacity needs to nearly quadruple. Uh, one of the most common methods um, to generate on-site solar energy uh, is rooftop PV systems. Um, based on current trends, rooftop PV systems will make up 20% of total sol solar capacity, uh, which makes sense as buildings uh, make up 75% of energy consumption in the U.S. Um, however, uh, there's insufficient rooftop space uh, for these PV systems to meet the energy capacity needs, as well as issues such as overshadowing, um, render some PVs uh, and unusable during certain times of the day. Another common method is land-based solar farms. However, um, 52 times the area of Charlotte um, is needed to meet these energy capacities, which you can imagine um, is not a good thing. Uh, it can have a multitude of ecological issues, such as deforestation, the flattening of uh, typogra topography, um, as well as the destruction of local ecosystems. And both of these methods require the building of new infrastructure, um, which makes additional material constraint material needs, as well as generates additional costs for consumers. And because of those problems, a lot of building owners couldn't go solar, but with uh, what but Recon will tackle the BIPV challenges by first of all using a hybrid circuit connection between each component of the BIPV system, um, and that, uh, we, that will increase the energy yield and as a result reduce the ROI period, and it will also reduce sales degradation. Second of all, uh, because the PV material are 
between in the double pane of glass, there is no soiling effect and operational maintenance will be much easier. It will also increase system performance. And third, uh, because it is integrated into already existing system, the cost of material will be much lower and there's no need to invest in land and on-site uh, clean energy generate on circulating energy. So with our product, building owners can supply their building with solar energy without overpaying for the material or paying for high cost of land, while they will, they will also save on energy bills and carbon taxes. The BIPV market in the US was $2.3 billion in 2021, and it is exponentially growing. Um, our beachhead market will be California because the California uh, mandate the renewable energies integration into the building, and it also ranked as number first uh, state in total solar uh, installed capacity. Our target customers will be commercial and residential buildings. Uh, in terms of cost, based on initial market surveys, um, one unit of recon window uh, will cost around two hundred dollars per square foot which is comparable to the cost of a regular double pane glass window, which is $150 per square foot. Uh, there are a number of companies currently serving the solar market. However, they mo are mostly based on rooftop or facade systems, uh, which do not take into account occupants comfort, uh, production sufficiency, performance and partial shadows, um, or aesthetics. Um, but because Recon is a building integrated system that's uh, integrated into uh, pre-existing glass windows, um, it meets all these factors. Our plan to expand uh, is we're going to use the initial funding for partner acquisition, and we are going to partner with sales associate and PV module manufacturers. Sales associate will uh, get us in contact with architects and engineers in the uh, construction and building industry. And we are going to implement our product in one office building in our beachhead market um, that they are willing to reduce their energy bills and we are going to generate $1 million revenue. By the end of 2023, we are going to break even. In 2024, we are going to do some quality assessment and system performance enhancement services. And we are targeting to secure more capital by implementing in three to five other commercial buildings in non beachhead market uh, location. And that's when we are going to generate revenue. As we show the successful track record of the technology, we are going to uh, gradually ramp up the number of implementation by the end of 2024. Thank you, and we are happy to answer any of the questions you may have. You um, maybe touched on this a little bit, but it sounds like the core technology is like how you're integrating the electronic components together. Um, but then you also need the solar component to it as well. Have you thought about which ones you might use or how you will go down that decision path? Um, because the primary uh, problem of the BIPV facade systems are shadow, um, partial shadows and panels are not operating um, very good in, in, those, in that condition. We are going to design the circuit connection of the panels based on the, the in-depth shadow study of the uh, building geometry, facade orientation, um, uh, geographic location, and all of those uh, design criteria. And then uh, in terms of putting the, uh, the product or the unit together with, uh, in early stages of the, our uh, startup company, we are going to um, partner with, um, facade, uh, uh, with PV, uh, man, PV module manufacturers and that they, they are going to do this for us. Um, did I answer your question? Do you want to do a No, no that's great. Yeah, thank you. I can ask another if no one else has questions on the judges side in terms of you know what buildings you might want to target first or what markets um, you mentioned California but I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about do you have preferences for types of buildings either from like who owns them or from size you know all those considerations. Yeah, yeah definitely so um, this problem is uh, mainly related to tall buildings, meaning five story and higher. And then also we are going to do B2B uh, business to business um, uh, business model. And um, those building owners who they are going to um, use their own buildings and own it, um, will be more willing to uh, integrate this product into their building because they're 
the ones that they are going to pay for it and also use it. Um, so we are targeting those uh, um, those those customers and also office buildings um, in the commercial sector. Um, based on our market uh, assessment survey, they are the uh, they will be our first target customer. Just a, a, a question around, is this product, would this be for like new construction? Would you have to have new construction or would this be a retrofit? So you can go into an existing building and install this easily. It could be both, but um, in order, because we are in the earliest stage of, of our company, we don't have that much of the capital or funding. Uh, we are targeting a new uh, build, uh, new buildings that we are going to be built. Um, but down the road, uh, we can also um, um, target the, the, the retrofitting buildings too. Is there any certification that you need to go through for you know getting this approved for new construction or retrofit? Um, not not certification specifically, but this product should be based on the building codes, and um, we are we are uh, running the um, tests um, in the chamber and those environment uh, that required in our lab uh, to get it uh, get the standards um, and how they how the facade will perform um, based on the building codes. Thank you so much, Team 7. Thank you. We will transition to Team 8, Sustainable Lithium-Ion Battery Recycling. Hello. Great. Ready whenever you are. Hi, my name is Caroline Morin, and I am representing Rely. Rely aims to recycle all forms of lithium ion batteries to recover their critical materials and reintroduce them back into the supply chain. Now, why is this important? Developing a circular economy for lithium ion batteries will become critical in the next decade. Drivers such as the growing adoption of electric vehicles and implementation of grid scale energy storage is leading to a 12% annual growth rate in the lithium ion battery market, which at the end of 2031 is projected to be $1.9 trillion. And this directly correlates to a five time increase in the demand for the metals that are used to make lithium ion batteries. These critical metals are primarily sourced from mines in South America, Africa, and Australia, and refined and usable products for in China. As the demand increases and we continue to electrify our economy, the United States will become further dependent on these foreign partners. On the other hand, we will actually be building a stockpile of spent batteries with the DOE predicting 11 million metric tons by 2030. Lithium ion battery recycling accomplishes three goals with one effort, using mounted waste materials, increasing the US's critical materials supply and building US control in the metals market. So Rely provides an end-to-end -end recycling process from the collection of spent lithium ion batteries to the sale of the recovered raw materials. We offer several key advantages compared to other proposed recycling methods. So to start, we can accept all forms of lithium ion batteries, regardless of the chemistry or the assembly. This reduces the logistical and costly challenge of pre-sorting different battery types and ensures resilience as new configurations evolve. In addition, we will use Oak Ridge National Laboratory's robotic disassembly system to safely and efficiently deconstruct battery packs. This reduces our workforce's exposure to toxic chemicals as well as explosions from partially charged batteries. The cell casing, cathode, anode, and electrolyte is then shredded into what's called black mass. And that moves on to what the core component of our process is, the recovery of the critical materials. Developed by Idaho National Laboratory, our electrochemically assisted separation method recovers the critical materials from black mass with a low energy input and limited chemical waste. This method not only achieves high recovery rates of cobalt, copper, and nickel, the most lucrative components, and therefore the, start, the standard targets of many existing processes, but we also recover high rates of lithium, aluminum, manganese, and several organic compounds. We can then sell these products at battery grade levels of purity. To some, we provide a safe, efficient, and sustainable system to recover valuable constituents from mixed spent lithium ion batteries. It's also profitable using Argonne National Laboratory's Everbat a battery recycling process and supply chain financial 
Capital, we predict an annual net profit of $43.2 million with capital recovery in only five years. This revenue could be even higher if we factored in government policy that provides tax credits for domestic manufacture of critical materials. We have a planned feed of 10,000 tons of spent lithium ion batteries per year, which is only 0.1% of the total available market anticipated by 2030. To achieve this 10,000 tons per year, we have a three phase development strategy. We will start by scaling our technology with the goal of maintaining the same recovery efficiency achieved at the bench. We will also establish partnerships with utility and auto companies to help facilitate collection of spent batteries. Next, we will build our first recycling plant in Western Kentucky with an objective of processing 1,650 tons of spent batteries our first year to break even. Finally, we will optimize our plant operation to achieve our targeted capacity by the initial peak of the market and in the future expect to grow beyond that capacity. So beyond being a profitable business, Rely can have an impact economically, environmentally, and socially. By providing a stable domestic source of several critical materials, our fully American end-to-end -end process will provide more market control as global demand for lithium ion batteries continues to rise. We will also prevent toxic chemical leaks and landfill fires from poorly discarded batteries while operating a process with lower energy consumption and reduced chemical waste than alternatives. Lastly, Rely will provide new safe jobs in communities that have been directly affected by our country's energy transition as well as improve accessibility of EVs and other lithium ion battery products. I would like to acknowledge uh, the rest of my team, students at the Department of Chemical Engineering at UVA and Darden School of Business, as well as the developers of this technology, Idaho National Laboratories and Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Does, does your business model assume that the, the battery feedstock uh, the, the spent batteries will be given to you or you're going to have to purchase them? What's the initial economic relationship there with, with getting the initial batteries? Certainly. It's, there's a range currently in practice. There's a lot of places, a lot of times you have to incentivize um, people to bring in batteries. And so that provides that initial investment to, to purchase them. But we expect specifically working with utility and auto companies that we'll be able to arrange uh, an agreement where we're able to um, where we're able to recycle their batteries and like provide those raw materials back to them at a reduced rate. So Everbat actually takes into account that initial cost when we were able to do our estimate. So they, they account for the cost of the batteries going in. When, when you go through the, the process, what percent is, um, is waste that you can't resell? So actually we are able to recover um, 100% of the critical components. There are some components of, of the plastic casing um, mm -hmm. and some of the iron and aluminum um, that we are not able to fully recover. So we do have the recover efficiencies for most of the, um, other, some of the components, um, as some, as some of the different chemistries. But as you can see, for at least all of the primary materials, we're achieving very high concentrations for these active components. Hey, thank you. Um, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask, um, and I don't know if this is easily answered, but I mean, when recycling batteries to recover these these uh, various elements, how, how does that compare to mining? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So I mean, it really depends on the element. So. For example, something like lithium, that's a mineral that's often found from more surface level um, mining activities, a lot of times in very remote areas where there's already been a lot of drought and it's like a, basically a glacial lake has, ev has evaporated and there's mineral deposits um, versus cobalt, which was primarily sourced from the Dep Democratic Republic of Congo and has a significantly high mortality rate of people who operate within those mines. It's very poorly regulated. So it really depends. There's a range of, I guess, human health errors specifically associated with mining as well as like economics. But I think one of the main drivers here is not just that mining is, you know, has some of those social issues. It's more that we are going to require such a high volume of these different metals that even just with the mining sources that we anticipate now, we are going to exceed that. So we need to start recycling before we reach that, that critical bottleneck.
Oh, this is, uh, you might have already kind of alluded to this, but I was just wondering who, like, you would sell these raw materials to, like, who is your end customer there? Totally. So, I mean, like, I knew I was really just introduce it back into the, the supply. So, the, the materials themselves are used for a lot of different types of industries. A natural partner is other battery manufacturers. There are people who are looking to do a combined plant where you're both recycling a battery, you produce these raw materials, and then you make new batteries, um, like all in one swoop. Um, and so that does have an, an, an advantage because you're able to establish those partnerships. But you know things can change when like some different battery chemistries are prioritized and maybe you don't need as much cobalt in batteries anymore. So then you sell it to the magnet you know, field to be able to produce it. So the intent is to produce a quality enough um, purific a purified product that it doesn't matter where it goes. Thank you. I don't think we have time for another question. So we'll thank you team eight and get ready yeah. for team nine. Remove heavy metals from coal, coal fly ash in wetlands. Allison and team nine, are you ready to share screen? Hi, yes, we are ready. We do not see your screen yet. It's coming. If you wanna do, great, we're all set. On screen. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Allison File. I'm Oak Bandicar. And we are Soul Cooking. 2.6 billion people around the world like access to sustainable cooking methods, often relying on wood or gas stoves that can lead to heart disease, stroke, and even heart failure. What might surprise you is how large scale this issue is within U.S. homeless populations, consisting of over half a million individuals who suffer from higher rates of respiratory illness and death due to the consistent burning of plastics and rubber. This releases large amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere, contributing to many of our current air quality and climate issues. Through the NSF i program, we've completed over 100 customer discovery interviews in order to more fully understand the problem and potential solutions. Through this experience, we were able to identify the solar cooking industry as a potential option. With many of the current solar relief organizations, while doing incredible work, are focused internationally, leaving local populations without the, within the U.S. without the help they need. To further illustrate this issue, we've included a video discussing the problem within our local Charlotte community. Thousands of individuals around the Charlotte community lack access to consistent cooking sources, oftentimes relying on burning plastic and rubber, which can lead to higher rates of respiratory illness and death. This also releases a large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, contributing to many of our current air quality and climate issues. COVID-19 has only exacerbated these issues, increasing the vulnerabilities associated with respiratory health and causing more than 13,000 families to be evicted from their homes in 2020 alone. Soul cooking is needed now more than ever, and here's why. It can reduce the environmental impact and carbon emissions of these populations. With climate change increasing every day, it has become imperative to develop new and lasting ways to utilize energy in a clean and sustainable manner. Soul cooking will be able to greatly reduce the annual CO2 emissions generated from open fires, with homeless communities to providing a sustainable carbon-free alternative for cooking. An open fire generates about 60 grams of emission for every hour of use, composed of harmful gases such as CO2, sulfur oxide, and nitrogen oxide. Therefore, the homeless communities within the U.S. can account for about 13 million pounds of carbon, amassing to $1 million in cost savings yearly. Additionally, soul cooking also promotes the reintroduction of homeless populations back into the economy and improves health outcomes by reducing smoke and soot inhalations through the utilization of clean energy cooking methods. To further our industry research, we've completed our own trials utilizing a variety of solar cookers to compare among the five pertinent categories seen above. The existing competitors exist in two quadrants, providing solutions that are either inefficient and affordable or costly and effective, leading to very little social impact. Therefore, solar cooking aims to bridge the gap between these products, developing solar cookers that are both effective and affordable. To validate our product design, we're able to develop Simulink and CAD models to simulate the heat transfer for various types of meal options and weather conditions, along with FEA analysis to confirm the model's structural stability. Furthermore, we were able to obtain user feedback through piloting with Hope Vibes, a nonprofit dedicated to providing direct relief and awareness to homeless communities within the Charlotte-Mecklenburg region. This experience provided us with a greater understanding of how to partner with nonprofit organizations, which will be instrumental as we begin to scale from Charlotte to different regions across the US. 
Through our customer discovery, we identified the customer segments as humanitarian relief, nonprofit, and government organizations. With roughly 3,000 homeless individuals in Charlotte, the initial total addressable market in Charlotte would be 240,000, while the reachable TAM for half a million homeless individuals in the U.S. would be 50 million. For a pricing model, the total cost of a sole cooker includes manufacturing would be almost three times less than the average market cost. Currently, our profit margin would be $40 that we hope to increase with additional production. In terms of our milestones and business plan, we've been able to acquire over $7,000 in funding from the National Science Foundation's iCorps program, as well as from first and second place awards in the Charlotte Venture Challenge and the Epic Innovators Competition. While we've been able to pilot our prototype, we plan to conduct a full-scale pilot by April of this year, followed by seed rounds in our first commercialization in 2024. The sole cooking team is composed of two four merit scholars from UNC Charlotte. Moak serves as a CFO with a bachelor's in economics and bio and a concentration in public health. He has experience working for the Center for Disease Control as well as the Public Health Department and is part of the Business Honors Program. I serve as a CTO with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and a concentration in energy, having worked on various Department of Energy projects as well as internships at Raymond Tillman Duke Energy. Soul Cooking also has many primary advisors that have aided in um, everything from market identification to product design and business development. As we continue to scale from Charlotte to other U.S. cities, we look to further expand our team to include additional nonprofit and business development specialists that can help us identify the unique needs of the city and the homeless individual served. All right, thank you so much for your time today. We'll now take any questions you may have. I, I uh, think it's very, very inventive what you guys are, are doing here. And uh, just a, a question from um, a cooking perspective, how can you like boil water? Can you cook an, uh, a roast? What can you cook? Yeah, you can really cook about anything. You can do water, you can do, um, you can put chicken in there. Meat is able to get it to 300 degrees actually. So within about 20 to 30 minutes, so you can cook any kind of food you want. It's definitely safe to consume. So there's, if you look actually online, you can see lots of menu options for solar cookers. It's kind of, the opportunities are endless there. Is the, is the delivery model or the, the kind of who's actually paying for the cooker is that local nonprofits that'll buy X number of cookers from you and make sure that's distributed and then you know what it what's the plan for recycling these and get them to to other other folks in the homeless community sure so uh yeah i like you're alluding to a lot of um our, our direct uh, customers would be these nonprofit and governmental agencies like public health departments and um nonprofits that we've already piloted with and um have done customer discovery interviews with to see if um these are potential solutions that uh homeless communities need, but also things that they'd be willing to invest in um, for those needs. Um, I think, uh, what was your second question was uh, related to recycling? Just how would you reuse them, make sure they're, they're being properly recycled, moved through as, as somebody's coming out of a homeless situation, um, redistributor? I think I understand the answer is probably the responsibility of the nonprofit um, boots on the ground crew. Yeah, so uh, what we hope to do is to be able to um, have uh, sort of uh, the ability to sort of track where these um, end up going to, and have those be the responsibility of the nonprofit um, so that, that that way they can sort of uh, make sure that these are being returned to as these homeless individuals um, uh, are, are no, no longer needing those types of services. I just wanted to clarify a little bit on you know exactly where the technology innovation is and I assume it's in the design but I think I missed exactly like what that is and how it separates you and especially in terms of cost. Yeah absolutely so basically there's kind of two different brackets we're able to find from our customer research. There are certain um, solar cookers you know are very like um, they take you know typically one to two hours or so a very long period of time to cook the food and they can you know use the cheaper materials and then the other end is they have these kind of high-end more um, kind of for family camping and like backpacking type market and they are typically range from like 100 to 250 dollars for these products and they um you know cook them in closer to 20 to 30 minutes so we're kind of what we're looking is taking both of these and finding a solution that's able to utilize you know that cooker that faster cooking time from 20 to 30 minutes but using cheaper materials that allows you to um you know can like distribute it nonprofit. It's not going to be that such a high cost we're able to make it easier for them to afford it and distribute it to more of these homeless communities
Are there any further questions? Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Soul Cooking. Thank we you. are now ready to transition to our 10th and final team of the evening. If we could please have team 10 join and screen share. We will be hearing about generating energy under your noses with footsteps. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm gonna reset my timer. Okay, hello all, my name is Matthew Tracy and today we're talking about the Tyler Sustainable Innovation Plan. So first getting into the technology, Every single day on busy streets, universities and cities, people walk around and press kinetic energy into the ground, but that energy dissipates to nowhere. Tyler is looking to capture that kinetic energy and convert to electrical energy, therefore utilizing kinetic energy and electromagnetic generators to produce electricity. The basic structure of a tile is a shaft that when depresses an electromagnetic generator, which consists of insulated coils of wires or solenoids, and a ferromagnetic core, which spins and extending the mechanical energy and in turn harvesting more energy therefore converting mechanical kinetic energy to electrical energy. Hence, every footstep that steps on a tire creates electrical energy for the grid. Now, moving on to the market assessment. Our key customers want to meet their sustainable energy needs. And our key customers are local government, universities, architecture, and construction firms, and stadiums, i.e. places with high foot traffic. I surveyed city planning and development professionals, and they stated their key pain points are trying to meet their sustainable energy needs with a lack of local resources. 91% of those surveyed planning and development professionals with an average of 17 years of experience, i.e. their managerial decision makers within their, within their firm, wanted a Tyler prototype. And here are some of the things they said. They said it was innovative, promising, very interesting. They're cheering it on. They love the idea. So now for the market. The market for sustainable electricity is large and only growing with the total, total available market in 2028 being 1,510 billion, the serviceable addressable market being 15.12 billion, and our SOM, our serviceable addressable market, being roughly 10% of that, 1.51 billion. There are two competitors globally, and, in the, and zero within the US. The two competitors are PaveGen and Energy Floor, which have different designs than us and pricing models, but there are currently no US-based companies developing this right now. What we are doing is we are filling unmet demand of local governments, universities, architecture and construction firms, and stadiums who are all looking for ways to meet their energy demand. One use case example is Kini Plasma Business School, which is trying to go green with different energy solutions, but doesn't have enough roof space for solar and land for wind. Instead, they can install Tyler within their school to fulfill the sustainable energy demand. Kini Plasma will be empowered as a small scale producer with the ability to sell energy back to the grid in times of high demand. In addition, companies and communities are trying to go green, and we have the unique opportunity to literally regenerate the community with our own footsteps. Our economic modeling uh, suggests that annual profits of 120 or 920K in year one. Our first year costs are on 580K. For producing 100 tireless sets, our fixed and variable costs are on $580,000, and with revenues of 100 tireless sets being 1.5 million, leading to profits of $920,000. This is broken down on the left on the first where you have the fixed and manufacturing costs, then the subsequent variable production and installation costs. Each Tyler set costing roughly $5,000 for us to make with production and installation. Then on the right, you can see the revenues per Tyler, which would roughly be $15,000 is what we charge to the customer, leading to $1.5 million in revenue. What do the customers of Tyler gain? Customers of Tyler have a 15 year NPV of $21,000 and uh, are profitable by year three, meaning that's pure cash flows for the customers. Now, what is the impact? Key stakeholders, beneficiaries are our customers. So local governments, universities, architecture and construction firms, and stadiums, they're all looking for ways to meet this energy demand. The environment by reducing fossil fuels required for a customer's electrical usage and our communities as they benefit from lower electrical costs due to community powered initiatives. Here we have our key SASB and jury issues on the dimensions of environment, social and business model innovation impact. And then on the right, you can see our key sustainable development goals of clean energy and sustainable cities and communities. The energy market is trending towards many small power producers. Advancing Tyler will lead to many small decentralized power producers that can actively participate in the system by sending excess energy back to the grid. We will partner with three key companies to increase tacit knowledge, efficiency, and funding. First, partnering with Quanta Services for their tacit knowledge in human capital and electrical engineering to install the Tylers. 
Next is the Carolina Angel Fund and their executive director, Ted Zoller, who's also my professor for seed funding. And then partnering with the Ackman Center of Excellence in Sustainability and their executive director, Jeff Middlestad, who's also my professor for recruiting talented Tyler employees. Tyler's to scale, scalable model suggests year five profits of 36.6 million, selling 100 in year one, 1,000 in year three, and 3,500 in year five. And with that, I am ready for questions. Thank you for listening. First of all, congratulations on using Wolfpack Red with the UNC presentation. That was <laughs> fabulous. I, um, I'm a transfer, so um, <laughs> I can I can do that. I can hold both privileges, I guess. <laughs> well done. Uh, what does the maintenance look like on, on something like this, just because yeah. of all the foot traffic and what's the replacement rate kind of anticipated to be? Yeah, the replacement rate, we're estimating it to be like in three to five years. So it's somewhere in that range. We don't have like an exact amount because essentially we're going to have to have like a piston that's going to beat the hell out of a Tyler to get the exact numbers. But that is the estimated amount that we're thinking. Thank you. How do you think about like installation? I'm assuming they're like yeah. individual tiles, both from like a cost perspective and also just like a technical logistics side. Yeah. So what we're going to try to do is we are targeting aftermarket. We're not trying to, well, this would be something long-term, but in the beginning, we want to talk to target aftermarket. So places that are already built, we don't want to go into these new construction products because that'd be much harder. So what we want to do is we want to place that already built and it's essentially like a four inch Tyler. So that takes away four inch of headspace. But when you're generating electricity and generating, you know, $3,000 of cash flow for only eight tiles, that's pretty beneficial for all these people to install. And then in addition to the second part of your question, it really is the same concept as solar panels. You have an inverter selection. So gener you got to convert that to DC current to the AC current of the electricity. And once that's done, you just simply inc uh, incur the electrical wiring of the inverter and the interconnection agreement. And then it's connected to the electrical system and fully integrated. Thank you for your question. How, how long have the um, the two companies that you talked about in the UK and in somewhere else, have, have they been in business? Avgen, I believe they were trying to build up a lot of R&D and they've been around, I think, for maybe like le maybe three fourths of a decade. And then Energy Floors, I think, was in Sanchez and started around 2018, if I'm correct. Um, and their pricing models are different and the product is different as well. For example, Energy Floors, they have solar panels. On their flooring so that's what they're trying to market and then pave gen is doing something that's a little bit different of a spin so each one kind of has their own segment i think they're trying to target with their own different idea of r d and innovation okay and, and yours is completely different from that as well yeah it's it, in regards to patent laws yes right yeah Are there any additional questions? I can uh, I can ask another one. Um, you kind of already talked about this, but maybe we can dig into it a little bit more with the last mm -hmm. minute is sort of like, who would your very first customers be? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And for us, it's mostly targeting places of high foot traffic. So if you think about places like South Point Mall, Keenan Flagler Business School, the union C inside the student union, they're getting 2000 foot traffic every single day. And for our model estimation, we're estimating 1300 people walking over them. So in places like that, we have even higher foot traffic. That's a place where it'd be an easy sell. Like I've already talked to people in the ACE center, which is at Keenan Flagler and places like that to see if we can implement something in the flooring um, as students are walking in. Cause it's also just like fun for people walking around because they realize like I'm really generating electricity for my school. So it's a pretty, fun concept for students as well in regards to sustainability and electricity. Yeah, you could you could uh, potentially have a meter somewhere where yep. there's a lot of foot traffic and exactly that's that's the plan. Yeah. That'd be pretty neat. Yeah. Well thank you so much, team 10. And thank you to all of our amazing teams. Um, we can give them a virtual round of applause as we move on to the next part of our program. Judges, we are going to move into the separate judging room to deliberate, and I am going to pass the mic on to Michaela Cardona, RTCC's
program manager to introduce our guest speakers. We will see you in a little while. Hi, uh, just to jump in, sorry, um, this is Brittany. I'm um, working with NREL on the Energy Tech Hub University Prize. Um, I'm gonna put a survey in the chat um, and if you guys um, who participated could all fill that out, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, it really helps us to improve this competition for the future. Thanks. Thanks, Brittany. And thank you to our student teams. I want to second Deb's enthusiasm. That was absolutely inspiring. And I know the extra hurdle of being a virtual does not make it easy. So you all did a very good job. So as Deb mentioned, my name is Michaela Cardona and I'm the programs manager with RTCC. I'm happy to introduce our guest speakers for today. We're gonna to keep the inspiration going. Our first speaker is going to be Andrea Austin, our, the program manager at SEI. Andrea has over 20 years of experience in workforce development and currently leads the expansion of SEI's sustainability and workforce programs in North Carolina and the broader East Coast. She will be giving us an overview of the workforce needs in the clean energy industry and how we can best support young professionals to be the next generation of clean energy leaders. Then we will hear from Estelle Fighter Blazer, the product manager for renewable energy and smart gas solutions for Census, a Xylem brand, as she speaks on her journey that she broke into this industry and what lessons she's learned. We will have time for questions and answers after the program. So if you have any questions for either speaker, put them in the Q&A, or I know if the students, you can not access the Q&A as your panelists, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll make sure that we try to address every question that we can. So without further ado, Andrea, please take it away. All right, thank you, Michaela, for that introduction. And uh, congratulations, everybody, on your fantastic presentations. I have the pleasure of speaking to you today about career trends in the clean energy field. So my organization's name, SEI, stands for Strategic Energy Innovations. And we focus specifically on education and workforce development for clean energy and sustainability careers. SEI has been in existence for about 25 years now. Most of that time we've been on the West Coast in California, Oregon and Washington. More recently, we have expanded to the Southwest and to the broader East Coast. And we offer a sustainability leadership pathway from K-12 schools to college and all the way up to adults who are looking to transition into the clean energy field. And just a few uh, quick highlights of our work. Each year we work with over 230 schools 30 colleges and universities, and we place more than 150 emerging professionals like yourselves into paid Climate Corps fellowships. And I really encourage all of you to visit our website and take a look at those positions that are available across the country. So this is, as you may know, an incredibly exciting and unprecedented time for you to consider entering the clean energy field. Recent federal and and state legislation has mandated ambitious carbon reduction targets. It's helped remove barriers to clean energy technologies, and it has directed funding that will expand green jobs at levels that we have never seen before. In fact, last year, clean energy employment surpassed fossil fuel employment for the first time. So uh, if there, I'm kind of giving a, a round of applause uh, for that. I think that we're all excited about that. So on a global scale, the World Economic Forum is predicting a massive shift toward clean energy employment by 2030. So you can see in this chart, the largest increase will be focused on electrical efficiency, such as energy efficient buildings. That's followed by clean power generation and then the automotive sector. And in total, 13.3 million new jobs are expected to be created and in contrast to the 2.7 million jobs that will actually be lost uh, that were in the fossil fuel sector. And looking specifically at the United States, it, this aligns with that global trajectory. So you can see in this chart again, that energy efficiency, renewable energy, and clean vehicles make up the biggest share of employment uh, in 2021. 
Uh, you'll notice here, though, that uh, here in the U.S. and in, in that year, 2021, that energy efficiency holds an even bigger share. So that it held 70 percent of total jobs in the field. And I want us just to break this down a little bit more. Let's take a look at. Sorry, I'm moving some of my windows here. So energy efficiency, that includes uh, the Energy Star and lighting. And you can see the HVAC, both traditional and high efficiency HVAC, really tops the, the list with them. That's the, the biggest subsector. And then advanced building materials, renewable energy, solar and wind top the list. And then under grid and storage, the battery storage, clean storage is the biggest subcategory. Uh, clean vehicles, that's broken up between hybrid, plug-in, and electric. And then you can, I'll, I'll let you read what's on there for the uh, for fuels. So I, I just want to pause here and acknowledge that uh, some of you may be thinking like, well, it's really great to know about, you know, these sectors and the career trends in these sectors, uh, but perhaps you're on a different career path. You know, you might be pursuing a different major and you're kind of thinking about heading in a different direction. And uh, to all of you, I just want to share something that we always say at SEI, uh, which is this, that every job is a climate job. And for the purposes of this presentation, we can replace that word climate with energy because energy impacts, of course, all aspects of our lives and every vocation. So you might be pursuing communications or you might be doing psychology or you might be doing um, you know, some um, you know, government or advocacy sort of work. And there is a place for, for all of you in the energy field. I thought you might find it interesting just to look at this data from uh, Yale graduates. So these were energy program graduates, um, you know, just to take a look at where they ended up. So you can see that about a fifth of them went into clean energy finance, another fifth uh, into consulting. Many of them went in to work directly with utilities or into government and public policy. But if you look at the other areas, you can see that there were just a lot of directions. Some went into the nonprofit sector, academia and research. So again, just just reiterating that there are lots of different paths within this field. I'd like to pivot for a moment to the important topic of diversity. And I think all of us here can agree that equity and equality are urgent and critical in themselves. So, you know, uh, point, stop, no further explanation needed. Uh, I also wanted to share that uh, research has been showing that diversity impacts companies' bottom lines. Diverse companies are more innovative, they're more productive, and as a result, they can be more profitable. Uh, unfortunately, we're still struggling with some aspects of diversity in the clean energy field, as many industries are. So you can see here, women are underrepresented, although we make up 48% of the workforce, uh, we only hold 27% of clean energy jobs. Uh, Black Americans represent only around 8% of clean energy jobs, even though they make up 13% of the workforce. So we do have some issues to overcome here, and I hope that all of you will consider being part of the solution. And in closing, I just wanted to give you all a reminder, you've probably heard it before, but about the, the importance of networking. So as you wrap up college and you enter the job market, please don't forget, this is an often forgotten truth that the majority of jobs, some say up to 80% are never posted on job boards. You're, you won't even see them on job boards because people get them through people that they know. So that is your network. So please go out and, and build your network, meet the other professionals in the clean energy field. And of course, that's not only to get jobs, but because these are the people that are going to be your colleagues in achieving the just energy transition. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. And that was a great presentation. I learned something new. So that's, um, that's always good. I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Um, so 
Andrej gave a great background on sort of why you should enter the energy industry and sort of the jobs available. And I'm going to talk a little bit more personally about my journey, the challenges I faced, advice that I have for entering the energy industry, and a little bit about um, what opportunities my company, Xylem, has. So my passion for energy really started when I was in high school. I had the chance to go to a summer camp for students who are interested in energy and the environment. Um, and it was there that I kind of realized how fascinating a problem that energy poses for the world. Um, but that's not to say that I was one of those people who, you know, woke up one day and knew what my goals were and the steps that I needed to take. I definitely did not. Um, but I knew that energy was an interest and a passion. I just wasn't sure how to make a career out of it. Um, so then I went on to college. I studied mechanical engineering and then did a master's in energy systems engineering. Um, and through college, I did um, a couple internships and I did some research in acoustics and the research in acoustics taught me a lot about data management, um, how you can model everything you want as a wave and also that I did not want to do advanced acoustics as a career. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, experience in other industries shows you uh, whether you want to do that industry, but also, you know, maybe you don't want that job. I also did um, an internship with a automotive company. Um, and that was really interesting for me because you, when you're designing a car, you've got all of these different pieces you're balancing, you're battering fuel efficiency or battery life um, with safety and comfort. Uh, and it's an interesting problem to think about. How do you balance all of those competing interests to create the best um, product for your customer? After college, I went on to join Xylem's engineering leadership uh, development program, which is a two-year rotational program where you rotate through three different roles. My first role, I was a technical analyst for our strategy and M&A team. So this taught me a lot about business case building, um, which you all are experts at now, um, and, and how to really determine if a good idea translates to being a good business idea. Um, I then did a rotation on our data science team where I built a machine learning algorithm that uses publicly accessible data to train a model to predict the location of lead service lines in a water distribution network. And this really taught me um, about the amount of unutilized data in the utility industry and the opportunity for solution growth in this field. I then joined the product management team on the energy side of our company, where I built out our business strategy um, for hydrogen gas and tested our products in hydrogen environments. So through my early career, I basically learned there's a lot of data to be real, to be leveraged, um, how to balance competing business needs, and how to convince people that my ideas were worth investing in. So all good skills. Um, and I've since joined now in my full-time role as a product manager for renewable energy and smart gas solutions, which is a long um, title to basically mean that I oversee our product roadmap for um, strategy as it relates to renewable energy um, and natural gas. So a big part of my job is helping utilities get the solutions that they need to meet their carbon emission reduction goals. So this includes using data, we love that word, um, to better track emissions and find leaks. Um, also exploring how hydrogen gas can be blended with natural gas to reduce the carbon footprint. So some challenges that I really that I faced um, and I continue to face, uh, they don't just go away once you've overcome them. I wish life was like a video game like that, but um, a big one is the energy industry is older. Um, so that's tough because I'm often the youngest person and also the only woman in the room. And I think a lot of young professionals kind of suffer imposter syndrome, especially when you're surrounded by these very smart people with decades of experience. Um, so to overcome that, you really have to learn to treat others as resources to build your intelligence and not challenges to your intel intelligence, um, even if they might actually be challenging your intelligence. Um, and another challenge that I faced early on was not having a mentor. I think everyone should have a mentor, whether it's formal or informal, but you need to have someone to ask those questions to that's not your manager or coworker. And that's really, that allows you to have those more candid conversations. So for example, when I was interviewing for the role that I currently have, I asked my mentor what she had looked for in the past when interviewing similar uh, candidates for similar positions. Um, and I asked her, you know, what questions do you ask? Uh, what answers do you expect? And then when I got to the interview, um, every single question I was asked was one that she had helped me prep for. 
Um, so I really think that, you know, that conversation with her helped me get the job that I have today. And then I think another uh, challenge is, you know, the energy in the clean tech world is very fast paced. There's something new and shiny every day. And it's really easy to kind of get pulled in every direction. And as someone who loves to learn, I feel there's days that I could just spend all day learning and um, no time doing, which wouldn't make me a very good employee. So uh, I've learned to streamline my news sources to get the most pertinent information to do my job. Um, so those are some challenges. My advice for you all, and you can take it or leave it, um, in order to enter the industry, I think you really wanna uh, research the energy industry and understand the role you wanna play. So whether that's, I wanna be a electrical engineer in the solar industry, or I want to do marketing in the wind industry, um, then based on that, you'll know what credentials you need. And credentials can mean anything from a college degree to specific uh, certificates. And then once you've sort of figured out, okay, I wanna play in this space, um, I really suggest joining a professional organization or connecting to other energy organizations on LinkedIn. I think that kind of goes back to that point where networking is really huge, especially in this industry. So once you've um, done those steps, you've got your job, you're in the industry, Congratulations. Um, the ways that I found that you can succeed the best is ask intelligent questions uh, and be organized. Uh, people will trust you if they think you're organized. So as long as you're organized in your professional life, uh, you don't have to be organized in your personal life. Um, and then connect with people uh, that are in roles that you'd like to be in. So think you know, a couple steps ahead and say, I like the role that this person has. How do I get there? And talk with them about their career journey. And then continue education, especially if your company is going to pay for it. Get those other certifications, um, challenge yourself to learn something new um, or do a role or pick up a project that you might not necessarily have done in the past. Um, and then, you know, a lot of companies have opportunities for young professionals, but these are a couple that Xylem has particularly. So we've got a lot of educational resources, podcasts, um, master classes educational blog posts. Um, we've got our specific student opportunities. So that's your, um, Xylem Ignite is our global youth program for students. Um, and that basically connects students around the world to solve water and energy problems. Um, and then we also have a hackathon once a year. Um, and then we also have a lot of early career opportunities. So that's, you know, uh, our leadership development program, like the one I was part of, We've got internships, and then we also have micro internships. So micro internships are, you know, five to 10 hour a week commitment instead of your normal 40 hour a week commitment. And if you've got questions on any of these other, on any of these things that I've talked about today, you can email me. My email's there on the bottom of the slide. So, yeah. And then I think it's question time. Yes, thank you so much. That was an incredible presentation from both of you. And I think, we definitely got some inspiration for the students here in the audience today. We do have a couple questions um, for you all as we wait for the judges' deliberation. The first one that's come through is, and I think Estelle, you mentioned mentorship and how important that is. How would you suggest someone find a mentor outside of maybe their manager or their direct supervisor? Yeah, great question. So I actually asked my manager to connect me with a mentor that was not her. Um, so I think that's one way. Uh, I think you can also, if there's someone that you meet via a professional organization or you see on LinkedIn, I think, you know, reaching out to them because uh, your mentors can be outside of your company as well. So I think um, those are two ways. Andrea, do you have suggestions? I just echo your recommendation and your presentation about the importance of professional associations. Uh, and in fact, uh, I have I still have a mentor uh, through the um, North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. I know all these students, you know, are coming from different states, but you know, look into the professional associations in your states and see if they have a mentorship program. That's part of that. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, and then our next question is, and I, I figured this one would come up, is what advice would you give to women who would like to enter this industry? And I'll, I'll leave either one of you to answer that one. Um, 
Um, my advice specifically for women is, um, you know, believe in yourself as cheesy as that sounds, but you are smart and you know what you're talking about. Um, and it, there are situations that can really annoy you. Um, but I think, you know, believing in yourself and then also building a community of support, um, even if you are not in a female dominated workforce, making sure that you have coworkers who will stand up for you and also, you know, believe that you're smart is important as well. So build a community of support and also believe in yourself. Yeah, say no to imposter syndrome, right? <laughs> Andrea, do you have anything to add? I would add to look for ways to connect more formally to women that are in the field. Uh, going back to the professional networks, there's a number of professional networks that are specific to women, um, like women in energy, women in clean energy. Um, prob there's probably other clean tech related women's networks that you can look into. Something else I want to say is make sure that you're supporting other women. Uh, you know, sometimes we, whether you, regardless of your gender identity, you can undermine um, other people in your field or there can be competition. Uh, I think especially as women who are underrepresented in the field, we need to support one another. Uh, we need to lift one another up. Uh, you probably have, you, you will have women that help you along the way. So you need to make sure that you turn around and then help uh, bring other women into the field and support them. Yeah, that's great. Empowered women empower women. Heard that before. And I just want to highlight that the Women in Clean Energy group, that's actually how Andrea and I met and how we got connected to, to do this presentation together. So networking and those types of communities go such a long way and are so important in this field. All right, we've got just a few more questions here. I think the judges are just about done. But let's do this one. Are there any books or resources you would suggest reading to learn more about the energy industry? Um, my favorite book about the energy industry um, is, it's called How the World Really Works and it, the author's last name is Smil, S-M-I-L. And I just think it's a very well-written, easy to read um, overview of sort of energy and the environment and sort of why we're in the problem we are today. So. I really enjoy the book uh, Drawdown and it's uh, written by, by the organization Project Drawdown that looks globally at ways to reduce carbon emissions. And they just provide an abundance of different strategies that help I think make it feel a lot more attainable and help help everybody be able to find their place in finding a solution. The other resource that I, oh, here we go, look at that. <laughs> a lot of us have it on our, <laughs> on our desk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the other resource I strongly recommend, uh, not, not a book, but is uh, professional conferences. So um, whenever there is a, a conference in your area or online, really take advantage. That, that's where I found some of the most uh, valuable and uh, current information about this field. And uh, once again, great for networking. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And Paul, thank you for that nice visual. <laughs> All right, I think we've got time for just one or two more questions. And this one's pretty interesting. What was something that surprised you about this industry? I think one thing that surprised me about the industry um, was how small such a large industry can feel. Um, you know, once you kind of start networking, that seems to be the key word of our talk today, um, is you kind of realize everyone kind of knows someone who knows someone who knows you. Uh, so it's a much smaller industry than it feels from the outside. I would say that what has surprised me, and uh, and I should um, clarify that I'm a career changer into the clean energy industry. I had um, a career that was a bit different um, originally, 
And something that surprised me is just all of the different niches within the industry and uh, how many different directions you can go and how many, you know, subsectors like I covered in my presentation and how different each of those can feel, both in terms of your technical expertise and also the culture. And so it uh, it's a good idea to, you know, again, just talk to as many people as you can, hold informational interviews and um, learn as much as you can to find out the place that feels like the right fit for you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I, I think kind of the theme of this program today was that there's a place for everyone in this industry and you will bring value to it. So with that, I want to everyone to thank our amazing speakers, Estelle and Andrea. Thank you for inspiring this audience today and for sharing your wisdom with us. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Now, we are just moments away from announcing who our winners are, but in the meantime, we have just a few requests. Uh, the first is for our student team, and this is just for student team members, audience members. We do have a request for you, but that will be next. Um, the, the link in the chat is the same link that will take the, that will bring this QR code to you, but please feel uh, use the QR code or use the link to take this five minute survey. This is for the DOE to use your feedback that really helps shape what this event looks like. And your feedback is very, very important uh, for next year's event. So please, I'll just pause on this uh, slide for just a moment here while you take your phones out and use the QR code. Again, the same link that Brittany posted in the chat will bring you to the same survey. And we really appreciate your time and feedback. All right, so I'm gonna move on. I hope everyone's got this. The next uh, ask that we have is actually for the audience. So if the audience it has been here for over half of the pitches, we're asking you to use the honor system here. You are eligible to participate in the Audience Choice Awards. This is our second year of doing this. And I'm gonna launch the poll here. Please take time to vote for one team that you believe really exemplified the energy of the competition, did a great business pitch. And again, please use the honor system. Um, we would like to keep this fair for all the student teams. So we'll leave this up for just a couple minutes. And the answers are rolling in. give about 60 more seconds for the audience members to vote. And just a reminder that there is some skin in this game. The winner of the Audience Choice Award will win a $200 gift card to be split among the team members. That's a highly sought out reward. All right, just 30 more seconds. See some coming in. All right, we've got about 10 seconds left. It is a tight race, so if you have not voted yet, please make sure you do so. Five more seconds. All right. We're gonna end the poll. And with that, I will not share the results. We will wait to do that as we announce everyone. And I believe that we did get word that the judges have returned. Deb, are you with us? I am. How's my audio? It's good. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I am, but I know that we are just compiling the uh, winners in our our, for our final presentation of those winners. So 
it will be ready shortly. All right, no problem. We've got a couple fun trivia questions. In the meantime, let me go back to... All right, so we're gonna do some fun trivia. There are no winners or losers for this. Um, I did use a lot of Google, my friend Google for this. So please use the honor system again and don't use that. And this will be a little bit more fun. So we're gonna launch our first trivia question, which is how many electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicle models do you think are currently on the US market? Go ahead and take your votes. All right, we'll give about 20 more seconds for folks to answer this one. All right. And then I'm going to end the poll. And I did get the note that panelists, you cannot vote, but I'll fix that on the next one. Let's share the results of what our audience thought. The majority thought 200. The actual answer is actually 50. So according to the EPA, there are currently over 50 EV and PHEV models on the market, and more models are expected to release in the coming years. So a round of applause for all of those who own those models. If you want to give a humble brag and give us uh, type which model that you drive in the chat, we will give you all some snaps for that. All right, we're gonna move on to another question. Oops. Is that one popping up for anyone? I'm not seeing it, Michaela. I, I'm on number two still. There we go. Okay, now we're gonna move on to this one. And this is very relevant for this audience today. What percentage of clean energy workforce are employed by small businesses? Yeah, for those of you in, in the panel that can't vote, feel free to put your answers in the chat. All right, we'll give just a couple more seconds for this one. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll, share the results, and our audience members think it is 15%. This one is actually uh, pretty wild. The answer, according to the 2022 DOE jobs report, is that 90% of clean energy jobs were at companies that employed fewer than 100 workers. So I think that definitely shows testament to how valuable student teams like this are that are going out there and really taking over this business. All right, I think we may have time for one more. Let's see. Let's do. Trivia number five, and I believe panelists, you are able to vote on this one. What percentage of total energy consumed in the United States is used to generate electricity? All 
right, we'll give just a few more seconds. I see some answers rolling in. We're gonna end the poll, share the results. And it looks like our audience think it is, thinks it is 40%. And that is correct. According to the EPA, 40% uh, of uh, energy consumed in the United States is used to generate electricity. So good job to the audience members. All right, Deb, feel free to stop me. Otherwise, I will keep going with the trivia. I think we need a couple more minutes. Okay, that's all right. We're going to, oops, let me stop sharing this one. And we're going to launch another trivia. What was the United States share of world energy consumption in 2021? All right, we'll give just a few more seconds here. All right, we're gonna end the poll. I'll share the results. Our audience thinks it is 31%. The actual answer is, according to the US Energy Information Administration, US total primary consumption was about 98 quadrillion BTU, which is British thermal units, which is equal to about 16% of the total world primary energy consumption. So our audience <laughs> thought we consumed a little bit more in the world. That means that uh, in comparison, the United States percentage share of the world population is 4%. So we have 4% of the population, but we are using 16% of the energy consumption. So something to work on with the United States. <laughs> Michaela, I think we're just a moment or so away from our slides being able to be shared. So I think maybe we'll just ask our judges to come back on screen and we will be ready to do that shortly. Um, we had a very uh, wonderful deliberation and um, before we share our results, I wanted to thank our wonderful judges, thank our wonderful guest speakers, thank everyone who is here, and turn it over to Lisa Bagwell to make a couple of comments based on the judging conversation. Thanks, Deb. So on behalf of all the judges, um, we'd like to thank, first of all, all the participants. I mean, you really showed a lot of hard work and passion for your in your topics really came through in each and every one of your presentations. So um, thank you for the hard work and being prepared for us today. Um, but like many competitions, there is only one overall winner, um, but we want to make sure we're acknowledging each and every one of you to continue with your projects. Don't give up. Um, just, just by participating in today's event, you're, you're all winners and you're well on your way to help providing a, a better, cleaner, more socially responsible world. So we really enjoyed listening to each and every one of you and all of your various projects. So thank you again. And I'm gonna turn it over to Deb to go through and announce the results. Thank you so much. I am hopeful um, that my colleague can pop back on because I do not have the slides here. Let's see. Michaela, I may need you to, to hey. help with that tech. Oh, Emma's here. Yeah, I've, been here. I've been here. Give me one second. I'll be, I'm, I'm literally getting the share screen teed up so I don't. Perfect. 
be the, the madness sausage making that went on to get this together. So give me about 30 seconds. Do we have any singers in the group who could entertain us? <laughs> I do have an energy joke for us while we wait. And if anyone wants to put their answer in the chat, feel free. Why is wind power so popular? Because it has a lot of fans. <laughs> <laughs> and Deb, I think we're ready. Okay, great. Well, to echo Lisa's comments, thank you all so much. It is time for us to announce the awards. We are going to start out with our first award. I feel like we need a drum roll. Our audience choice winner is Biocharm, the pursuit of carbon negative concrete. Thank you to everyone who was part of the event and voted. I will say that you also charmed the committee. So thank you. Thank Our you next. So much. <laughs> well done. Our next awards, we're going to announce the bonus uh, prize semi finalists. So the finalists that we will be putting forward will be judged. The Office of Technology Transitions, National Lab IP Licensing is coming from Relay. Oh, there we go. Sustainable Lithium Ion Battery Recycling. And so all finalists in these bonus prize categories will be moving forward to be judged on the pitch you that was recorded today. A finalist will be grouped with all other finalists that are named in all of the regional competitions, a winner will be named and will receive $25,000. So congratulations on becoming eligible for that next level award. Our next bonus prize that we will be sending forth is our building technologies office, the efficient solar hybrid PV thermal panel and system. So congratulations to your team. Our next finalist, going forward for the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management is the pursuit of carbon negative concrete. So biocharm again, thank you very much. And Edenic Energy will be going forward for the grid enhancing technologies in the Office of Electricity. So congratulations to your team. And our Solar Energy Technologies Recon Circuit Reconfiguration BIPV Technology, congratulations, we'll be moving forward as a finalist. And I believe our last is Water Ram Pump moving forward for our Water Power Technologies Office finalist. So thank you to all of these teams for identifying technologies and presenting commercialization plans that allow you to move forward and represent our region at those bonus prize competitions. Our last two awards, we like to name in the South Atlantic region, a runner up. And our runner up overall today is generating energy under your noses with footsteps. Congratulations on being named runner up. And our final regional winner, the one who will get our $3,000 regional prize is Relay Sustainable Lithium Ion Battery Recycling. Congratulations, Caroline and your team from the University of Virginia. Thank you so much, thank you. <laughs> we are thrilled to have you. And as Lisa said, we really appreciate that everyone put in such great effort and did such good work. We wish you all well. We will be in touch with everyone. We do put out a press release and HeroX will also be announcing um, our regional winner. So we are so excited to put forth such great, great teams. Congratulations. Thank you to everyone for attending and good night.